So welcome, everybody. This is the final morning of our workshop. And the first talk coming from New Zealand is by Noam Greenberg with the, with the title Cousin's Lemma in Second Order Arithmetic. Noam. Um, thanks, Russell. Um, so first, uh, yeah, I really would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, I really uh, hope you had a good uh, conference. Uh, I'm sure you did. I um, wish I could be there. I was disappointed not to be able to, but uh, hopefully we'll be getting to actually see some, some of you guys uh, within a few months or so. Uh, I'd like to be optimistic. So um, I um, want to talk about this um, project um, that started with the uh, honors um, project with a student that uh, Rod and I supervised in uh, Victoria and that turned out into a, um, a small project that I thought was, would be kind of fun to talk about. Um, so this is, uh, this is a joint with uh, our student uh, Jordan Barrett and uh, with Rod Dowley. Cousin's Lemma. So what is Cousin's Lemma? Cousin's Lemma is a principle of compactness. It's um, um, it's kind of like a continuous compactness or uncountable compactness. It's compactness for the unit interval or with a particular kind of an open cover. If I have an open cover, which is forced to be an open cover because for each point in the unit interval, I choose an open interval that contains it, then the principle says for these kinds of open covers, there is a finite subcover. And compare that with countable compactness that just says if you've got a countable collection of uh, open sets that cover the unit interval that has a finite subcover. Um, looking um, a bit forward to uh, the middle of the talk, I'd um, like to remind you that uh, countable compactness is equivalent to Weekernig's lemma uh, in the system of second order arithmetic. Um, and we're wondering what, what about Cousin's lemma? I'd like to give a reformulation of Cousin's lemma um, in the following. So here's a couple of definitions that we'll be using for the rest of the talk. A gauge yeah, um, is defined to be just a positive valued function on a closed interval. Um, given a gauge delta, um, a delta fine partition is a tagged partition. It's a partition of the closed interval into finitely many closed intervals. It's tagged partition means that every sub interval like choosing a point. Um, so the, the, the intervals are denoted as x0, x1, x1, x2, x2, x3, and so on. And the tag is xi1, xi2, xi3. So I break the interval up into n many sub intervals and at each one I choose a tag. And the requirement, the delta fine part, meaning that the, the size of the sub interval has to be smaller than the value of the gauge on the tag. Delta of xi is bigger than xi minus xi minus one. And this is a generalization of uh, what is known as the mesh size of a partition, right? If delta is a constant function with a positive value, then delta fine just means that the size of each interval is smaller than delta. That's called mesh size smaller than delta. Cousin's lemma, uh, reformulation is that for every gauge delta, there is a delta fine partition. And it's not too difficult to show that uh, this is a reformulation of the compactness principle that, that um, I stated on the previous slide. So why should we care? And I don't know if there's anybody in the uh, demographic, but uh, if you have uh, children the right age, I highly recommend Bluey even though it's Australian. Um, so why should we care? Um, the reason for why these things were introduced um, and why they're interesting really is because they're used for the development of what is known as the hence stockholz weil integral. This is um, a, general, a generalized integral and uh, let me just give you the definition of this integral um, as was given by Kurzweil and, 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 and in greater detail by Henstock. Um, so we've got a function defined on a closed interval AB, real valued. 
And I say that the value of the integral in the sense of hence to quartz file um, of that function on that interval is a real number R. If for every epsilon, there is a gauge delta, remember the function with assigns a positive value at each point of the interval, such that every delta fine tagged partition, the, the value of the associated partial sum in the sense of tagged, you know, partial sum that you're familiar with from Riemann integral, the value of this partial sum is within epsilon of the value of the integral. So this generalizes the, re, generalizes the Riemann integral. Riemann integration is if the gauge is required to be constant, right? Because then remember delta phi just means for any tagged interval with the size of each subinterval is smaller for every tagged partition where the size of every subinterval is smaller than delta, um, the value of the partial sum is within epsilon of the value of the integral. So now we just allow, instead of just taking constant gauges, we allow gauges to, to, to vary. So this is how this is a, a generalization of the Riemann integral. But here's a couple of examples of functions that are integrated um, using the gauge integral, the hensler kurzweil integral, which are not Riemann integrable. Um, first example, then, um, the indicator function for the rationals on the unit interval, the Richelais function, right? So how do I show that it is gauge integrable? Well, enumerate the rationals on the unit interval, Q0, Q1, Q2, et cetera. I'm given an epsilon greater than zero. Assign to the kth rational the value of the gauge epsilon times two to the minus k. And for irrational points on the unit interval, let the value of the gauge be one. Right. So this is strictly positive on every point on the unit interval. Um, but if you think about what a delta fine partition means, right, that means that the total length of all the intervals subintervals of a partition where the tag is rational, the total length has to be smaller than epsilon, which means that um, the total contribution of non-zero values of the function to a partial sum cannot be more than epsilon. And this shows that the, the, the Dirichlet function is gauge integrable with, and the value of the integral is zero and certainly not Riemann integrable. Here's another example. Look at uh, one over square root of x. Right. Uh, think about the, 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 the trying to, to, to integrate as a kind of game, right? Uh, opponent is giving me epsilon. I need to find a delta. The opponent is choosing partitions, right? It's a kind of, it's a, it's a pi three kind of uh, a game with three moves, right? So the opponent gives you an epsilon. I find, a, suppose that I want to find a small mesh size. Obviously the problem is in the first interval um, on the leftmost part, the one that contains zero. And the point is no matter how small the interval no matter how small delta is, if delta is a constant, then the opponent can choose a tag, which is sufficiently to the left where the value of the function is really, really large compared to the delta that I stated. So in, in, in the Riemann game, the opponent can defeat me. But in the Henstock game, I, I have kind of more leeway. And basically I say, I can force the tags, um, the, the, a high, if the function has a high value at a the point, then I can for, define the gauge so that it, the, any interval that contains it as a tag must be really, really small. All right, so it's, in some sense, I'm, I'm reversing the, the, the quantifiers here. Instead of first choosing a, um, a mesh size and then the opponent choosing um, partitions and tags, I, in a sense, first choose the tags in some sense and that forces a small mesh size, All right? So uh, this function is um, hence stock integrable with the expected value. And, and there's a variety of really nice properties of this, uh, of this integral. Um, in fact, it extends the Lebesgue integral. Right. Um, so this is a, perhaps you know, there's various reasons to be interested in it, but it, it gives a Riemann style definition of something that extends the Lebesgue integral. And it's actually quite close to the Lebesgue integral. Um, so you, you can get the value of the Lebesgue integral of functions without formulating measure theory. Um, it integrates all derivatives. 
all of them any like there's no continuously differentiable or, or, or absolutely continuous or any of that stuff every derivative is integrable with the expected value and we don't have to worry about improper integrals if something is um kind of if, if I had something which is an improper integral, uh, improper gauge integral, then it's actually a straightforward gauge integral, right? If 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 something is defined on eight is is integrable on a plus epsilon b, and I send epsilon to zero, right? So the left limit of of the interval goes to a, and this has a limit. Then in fact, I didn't need to take the limit after all. I could just take the integral on the entire interval from a to b. And Cousin's lemma, the the lemma that says for every gauge delta, there is a delta fine partition is the tool that is required so that this notion of integral isn't completely vacuous. If this is false, then every function is integrable and every value of is, is, is the value of the integral of every function. Right? So this is, this is really why we're, we're looking at Cousin's lemma. So um, how strong is Cousin's lemma? And here's a, here's a quote from, uh, uh, Russell Gordon, who wrote a, a big detailed book about all these various uh, extensions of the Riemann integral and a survey um, article, um, at, I think in the Bulletin of American uh, um, Mathematical Society, I'm not sure. Anyway, th th this is the title, The Use of Tank Partitions in Elementary Real Analysis. And he writes the following, the similarities between the proof of existence of delta fine tag partitions, in other words, the similarities between the proof of Cousin's lemma and the proof that the interval AB is compact are evident. This is no accident. The two statements are actually equivalent. Uh, can we read this? Then uh, kind of like, uh, as logicians, our eyes light up and say, hmm, what does he mean? What, do, what does he mean by equivalent? We know what equivalent means. Um, so, Russell Gordon did, wasn't doing reverse mathematics. Um, his evidence that these statements were equivalent, that Cousin's lemma is equivalent to compactness, is that he can use Cousin's lemma to prove a whole slew of statements that follow from compactness. So he has a long list, intermediate value theorem, uh, all the way through the properties of continuous functions and closed interval, they're uniformly continuous, they're integrable, and so on, they have a maximum. Um, mean value inequalities, and most of these are you know, looking forward equivalent to weak Koenig's lemma. So Cousin's lemma is compactness, compactness is weak Koenig's lemma. That kind of is, should be the end of the story. Um, here's an example for one of the arguments that, that really says like, these are equivalent because they do exactly the same thing. The um, uh, theorem, if f is differentiable and the derivative is strictly positive on a closed interval, then it is increasing on that uh, strictly increasing on that closed interval. Um, and here's uh, briefly the argument. Um, I can do this on every closed subinterval, so it's enough to show that FB is strictly bigger than F of A. Um, take a point in the closed interval. The derivative at that point is positive. So there is a small radius around that point such that the function is strictly increasing on that a neighborhood of size. So every point has a neighborhood on which the function is strictly increasing. Okay, so delta of psi gives you the radius of that neighborhood. Take a delta fine partition, it partitions the, the interval into finitely many pieces where each is sufficiently small so that they're increasing because their tag tells them that they're increasing. So f of x of zero is smaller than f of x of one and so on. And therefore f of a is smaller than f of b. So this is a typical application of Cousin's lemma. And, and that's what made Gordon say, this is equivalent to compactness. Well, so is it equivalent to compactness? So now let's work a bit more formally. Um, uh, we'll examine this in the, in, in the framework of reverse mathematics and second order arithmetic. And there's some kind of problem there to begin with, right? Because if you just look at the statement of Cousin's lemma, it is a third order principle, right? It says for every function delta, and there's no restrictions on one kind of functions. And it's, it's true for every function delta. That's what Cousin's lemma said, right? So, so possibly the, the correct, uh, setting to, to investigate the statement is within the you know, reverse mathematical third order arithmetic. And uh, Doug Norman and Sam Sanders have done that. 
and in fact showed that this is a fairly strong um, statement. Uh, Cousin's lemma for all functions is equivalent to full second order arithmetic within second or uh, third order arithmetic. Um, but nonetheless, um, somehow, uh, quite possibly because we're just much more, uh, me and Rod are much more familiar with second order arithmetic, we thought, well, um, what about second order arithmetic? And there, basically what you need to do is basically we, we can't talk about all possible functions. We have to talk about classes of countably coded functions and we'll, we'll restrict ourselves to, to, to classes of Borel functions. Um, and that's in some sense, you can argue that this is quite enough because say all functions that are gauge integrable are essentially measurable. They're not, it's not very far from the Lebesgue integral. And so the gauges that come up are gonna be measurable gauges. So if, if you're looking at the definable world, restricting ourselves to Borel functions is not a huge um, restriction. It, it, it won't prevent us from define, uh, developing the whole theory of, of the gauge integral. Um, well, I, talked about the proof of Cousin's lemma, but I didn't give you the proof of Cousin's lemma. So here's, here's the proof of Cousin's lemma. Um, right, so let Delta be a gauge on say the unit interval. Call a sub interval good if it can be part of a Delta fine partition. Right, I can find a tag in it where the value of the gauge on the tag is bigger than the length of that interval. Now, Look at the full binary tree of um, binary rational subintervals of the unit interval, intervals of this form, integer multiple of two to the minus n, and then the next integer multiple of the same two to the minus n, right? So the tree of the containment. Throw away all the good intervals, right? Uh, 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 this is this is. You know, a, a superset of a band interval is a, is a bad interval, so, uh, so this is a tree. And if this tree is finite, if there's only finitely many bad intervals, then I look at the, the leaves, these are kind of like the, the minimally bad intervals, they're children, i.e. when I split each one into two, they're already good intervals, and that's taking all of them together will give me a delta fine partition. So I just need to argue that this tree is finite. Well. It can't be infinite, uh, I'd argue that it can't be infinite. And I use the Koenig's lemma, right? Um, if it's infinite, then it has a path. It's a binary branching tree. Um, the path is a, is, is a path of shrinking kind of nested closed intervals. So it's got a, um, its intersection is gonna be a singleton, call it Z star. The value of the gauge on Z star is bigger than zero. So, in fact, any sufficiently small interval on that path is good, contradiction to the third line. This was a path of bad intervals. Um, now, if you think about the definition of good interval, right, there's a quantification here of on, on all points on this interval. So outright, it seems like this, to, to, to carry out this proof in a direct way, it would seem like we need pi one one comparison, which is a fairly strong axiom. Um, so, um, for the rest of the talk, what I want to do is, is to investigate uh, subclasses of real functions and, and calibrate the strength of Cousin's lemma for these particular functions and talk a little bit about um, how this goes. Um, so, at the lowest level, continuous functions. What if the continuous, I have a continuous gauge, the, the function that takes a, a tag to the radius is continuous. And so the first theorem is that Cousin's lemma for continuous functions is equivalent to E. Koenig's lemma. Uh, all equivalences are over um, RCA naught, recursive, uh, recursive comprehension. Um, one direction, uh, how do I prove Cousin's lemma for continuous functions from the axiom E. Koenig's lemma? Um, let's go back to the proof of Cousin's lemma. Right? If delta is continuous, how complicated is it to tell that an interval is good? And the answer is, well, if delta is continuous and an interval is good, then in fact, by continuity, I can find a rational point in the interval that witnesses this goodness. Right? If there's a 
point in an interval where delta is bigger than the length of the interval, then I can choose a rational point sufficiently close to it so that the value of delta on that rational point is also sufficiently big. Right, so, so being goodness, to check goodness, I just need to search over all rationals in this interval and that's a C process. So the tree itself is in fact pi zero one. And we can explain what tells us that um, infinite, you know, uh, that, 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 that pi zero one classes that shouldn't be empty are actually non-empty. So I can actually carry out the proof um, of Cousin's lemma within Wiconig's lemma. Of course, I don't actually need to work that hard um, this is special for weak Koenig's lemma. Weak Koenig's lemma continuous gauge has a minimum. The minimum has to be positive because the gauge is positive on every point. So any partition with sufficiently small mesh size suffices. So um, within weak Koenig's lemma, it's really not difficult to see that continuous gauges um, have delta fine partitions. Um, what about the reversal? Now, the, the proof of the reversal that I'm gonna give is not right in a, in a, a strictly kind of like a, it, it's not completely rigorous. Uh, if you look at our paper, then that's not the way that it's formulated, but this is the way that I really want to think about the proof. Um, I think that's the, 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 the idea behind the proof is what I'm gonna present here. And the idea behind the proof is um, I'm gonna prove contrapositive. I'm gonna show that the failure of Wiconig's lemma implies the failure of Cousin's lemma for continuous function. And I'm gonna imagine that I have a model. If you think about it as a standard model, it doesn't really matter, um, um, in which we can examine fails. So I have uh, the integers of the model, which you can imagine are the natural numbers. And I have that the, this model has some subsets of the natural numbers as its second order part. Um, and it doesn't have enough points to make we can examine true. It's not a, it's not a, um, um, a Scott set. Right, so what does that mean? That means that there is a, right, there's a tree without a path. Um, translating to the unit interval, what it means that there's a, a closed set which has a code in the model and is really non-empty, the tree is infinite, but the model doesn't have any points in it. Right? The model, no point in the model is also a point of that closed set C. So in the real world, it has elements, but the model doesn't know them. And I'm gonna define a, a continuous function. Uh, delta of x is half the distance between x and that closed set. That's a continuous function. Okay, it's not a gauge because it's zero on the points of C. But the model M doesn't have any points in C. And so the model M thinks, ah, delta is a continuous function, which is positive everywhere, i.e. M, the model M says, delta is a gauge. And in fact, a continuous gauge. Now I'm lying a little bit. Uh, um, this is not strictly speaking true. It's actually not continuous uh, with a continuous code in the model. I need to, to massage it, but the, these are technical details that are not really the, the heart of the proof. So um, modulus I'm lying, delta is a continuous function, is a gauge in the model. Um, now in the real world, there is no delta fine partition. Because if you think about the way that I define delta, for any partition into finite many intervals and every uh, tag that I choose, right? Um, none of these intervals are sufficiently long to cover any of the points of C, right? The, the, this, 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 this delta forces the intervals with the tag X to be sufficiently short that they cannot overlap C. That's why I define delta that way, right? So there is no delta fine partition because a partition covers the entire unit interval. But this property of being delta fine is, is this is a finite thing, right? There's finitely many points, finitely many tags, finitely many values of delta. Um, there's no difference in evaluating whether this is a delta fine partition within M or without, outside M. So if there is a delta fine partition within M, then there is a delta fine partition in the real world. And there isn't because C is not really empty. So there is no delta fine partition in M and Cousin's lemma for continuous function fails in M. And that's the, the proof by contrapositive. So that's uh, continuous functions. Next level up. So we imagine the, 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 the class of Borel functions uh, is, is um, 
given by a hierarchy, increasing hierarchy um, according to uh, bare classes. Um, at the lowest level are the continuous functions. And then uh, we get more and more uh, functions by the operation of taking uh, pointwise limits of sequences of functions. So a bare class one function is a function which is the pointwise limit of a sequence, countable sequence of continuous functions. Um, so here's a, a second theorem. Cousin's lemma for bare class one functions is equivalent to arithmetic comprehension. So um, in, in, in the big five, it's the, the next system up uh, beyond Wieck-Koenig's lemma, right? So this is the first indication that um, when Gordon says, Cousin's lemma is equivalent to compactness, that we have to be careful about what we mean by compactness. Com countable compactness is weak Koenig's lemma. Continuous compactness is weak Koenig's lemma. Cousin's lemma for more complicated functions is a more powerful statement. Um, so why is this theorem true? And let's, uh, let's look at one direction, um, argue from, from ACA naught. And then all our direct proofs are basically gonna be arguments that says for this class of functions and this system, you can carry out the, that proof of Cousin's lemma that I illustrated in the very beginning, that proof that seemed to be using uh, pi one one comprehension. If the, 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 the function is continuous, then we Koenig's lemma is strong enough to carry out this proof. If the function is bare class one, then arithmetic comprehension is strong enough to carry out this proof, right? And the point is, uh, another characterization of bare class one functions is that these are the functions that pull back the inverse images of open sets are sigma zero two, uh, F sigma sets. And zero double jump can tell whether a given light phase sigma zero two set is empty or not, right? You think uh, whether given um, the index set of pi zero one classes um, that are empty is CE and therefore zero jump computable. Uh, being an empty pi zero one class is a CE event by compactness. So I can actually tell eventually whether it's empty or not. And so now sigma zero two is just uniform uh, countable unions of those. So I, I need another jump to ask whether each one of those closed sets that I'm taking the union of is empty or not. So zero double jump can tell whether a given sigma zero two set is empty or not. Now, if you look at the definition, let's hurry back to the proof of Cousin's lemma, yeah, an interval is good. If delta is bare class one, what does it take? How complicated is this notion of goodness, right? I'm just asking whether a given sigma zero two set, right, those points in the interval i whose value is given from a given thing, that's a pullback of an open set. So that's sigma zero two. So being good is sigma zero two. And so in arithmetic comprehension, that tree from Poisson lemma is an element of the model, it exists. And so I can carry out the proof. Now, in the fine print, there's an always non-standard model fine print um, where the, the, there's the, this other part of the proof that says, um, oh, wait, yeah. There's this other part of the proof that says, uh, if T is finite, then the children of the leaves form a, Delta fine partition, that means I need to take all of these intervals and combine them to form a delta fine partition. This also means that in each one, I need to find the tag. Now, if it's really finite, if it's a standard model, then each interval contains a point. Uh, I choose each one, one for each point, that's great. Um, in a non standard model, um, the collection of leaves is an M finite set for the model. Uh, but I need a separate argument to show that I can actually have this choice of point. Um, but I can, and, and I you know, don't think it's that interesting to, to, to argue for why exactly, but, but you can do this. This is, uh, this is something that I can do in arithmetic comprehension, choose a point from a sequence of non-empty sigma zero to six. It's in fact an infinite sequence, but um, here an infinite sequence suffices. What about the reversal? Now the reversal is, is actually kind of similar to the reversal of, for the continuous case, right? Um, so take, uh, again, I'll argue by contrapositive, take a model in which arithmetic comprehension fails. I'll show that Cousin's lemma for bare class one functions fails. Right, so step one, there is, because, uh, 
you know, relativizing to an oracle, zero jump is not an element of the of the model. So um, um, because there's there's Turing complete left C reals that says that there's some left C E real in the unit interval, um, which is not an element of M. And I'm gonna play the same game. Let delta of X be half the distance between X and that point Z star, that left C real, right? So because Z star is not an M, Z star is the only place where delta is zero. So M thinks that delta is a gauge. Now delta is continuous, but to find a continuous code for the function delta, I need Z star. So, so M doesn't know that delta is a continuous function, but it's still definable in M and I can give it a definition as a bare plus one function. That's because Z star has an approximation, which is in the model. The, the, the computable approximation from the left that converges to Z star. So um, the same argument as for the continuous case, the, in the real world, there is no delta fine partition because no such partition can cover Z star. The, the delta is sufficiently fine so that um, it forces the interval to not contain Z star. Um, and this is an absolute notion. So if there's no partitions at all, there's none, no, no things that M thinks are partitions. Um, and and the, again, the, 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 the non-standard model fine print says uh, that's actually important to take Z star left CE rather than just arbitrarily delta zero two, because there's some kind of use of sigma zero one induction in this argument to, to show that, you know, if I have a finite, you know, infinite M finite partition, then Z star actually has to be in one of those intervals that, that, that takes some induction. Okay. Um, so this is our third and last theorem, um, Borel function. So you, we went from continuous, went to um, bare class one, and now you'd think, well, maybe we'll have increasing theories or so back class N, we need N plus one jumps or something like that. But the answer is no, it, it, it immediately collapses after that. Bear class two, which are pointwise limits of bare class one functions, um, Cousin's lemma for that already gives you all Borel functions on so bare class alpha for all countable ordinals alpha. And both of these are equivalent modulo sum induction to the system of arithmetic transfinite recursion at ATR naught. So that's the next system up, you know, among the big five, it's the one that comes after arithmetic comprehension. Let's do the forward direction. ATR naught, how do I prove Cousin's lemma for all Borel functions? Um, well, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a kind of like a, some kind of analogy that happens between hyperarithmetic theory, pi one one theory and, and working in ATR naught. So for example, here's a, here's a theorem outside reverse mathematics. If I have an infinite pi one one tree, then it has an infinite delta one one subtree. Um, corollary of that, every infinite pi one one tree has a delta one one path. Why is this true? Because pi one one in, in the kind of uh, uh, the church clean omega one in recursion is, is a higher analog of CE. And I can, uh, so I can view it as, 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 as a set of strings that's enumer enumerated along omega one CK many steps. And if it's infinite, then sigma one one bounding will tell me that I can't just enumerate just finitely many things, finitely many things at every computable stage, I only have finitely many things. And then it's somehow at the limit at stage omega one CK, I will, I will have enumerated the infinitely many things. The, the sigma one one bounding precludes that uh, equivalently, you know, the omega one CK is an admissible order. This cannot happen, right? So that means that there's some computable stage by which I've already seen that the tree is infinite and everything that's been enumerated by that computable stage, that's delta one one and hyperarithmetic. And then, Hyperarithmetic is closed under taking a jump. So if there's a hyperarithmetic tree, then, then uh, and it's infinite, then there's a hyperarithmetic path. Now reasoning in ATR naught is a bit a bit different because it's not there's no one-to-one -one exact correspondence between models of ATR naught and kind of hyperarithmetic theory. The, these are the, the, the models, in fact, cannot be of the form hype x for some x. Um, 
But nonetheless, a lot of these kinds of ideas can carry over. And with sufficiently much induction, you can, you can push this through. So for example, ATR naught plus sigma one on induction, this is, this is not new. You can, you can see this in Simpson's book. You can, you can, you can get pi one one dependent choice, which basically says, you, know, you can find paths through infinite pi one one trees. So the tree doesn't exist in the model, but nonetheless, if it's infinite, then I can find a path. All right, so the proof of Cousin's lemma in this context will tell me um, that if I've got a, a, a function with Borel code, the, the tree will be pi one one. Um, there's gonna, there cannot be a path, so the tree is bounded. And now I need a bit more induction again to show that if I've got a uh, like to, to, to show uh, essentially bounded pi one one comprehension in ATR naught, but that but it's true. I can I can prove that. Um, and, and, and moreover, this process of choosing a, a tag at every, for every leaf, which could be infinite if, if, if I'm in a non-standard model that also re requires some kind of induction or, or some choice principle, but all of this is, holds an ATI naught with enough induction. So for Borel functions, I can really push the, the, the proof that seem to use pi one one comprehension. I just have to be a little bit more clever about it and, and ATR naught plus induction is sufficient. So now let's let's uh, think about um, um, the reversal. All right, so the reversal, we'll have to show that uh, Cousin's lemma for bear class two functions implies ATR naught. Um, so first of all, um, the first step is I, I really want to work in Cantor space rather than the unit interval. And it's not difficult to translate between the two. In fact, um, you can show even in RCA naught that for every bear class, um, Cousin's lemma for bear class alpha um, is equivalent to Cousin's lemma on Cantor space for, for, for the same bear class. Um, what, what is Cousin's lemma for Cantor space? Um, Think, think back to the, 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 the original formulation in terms of compactness, right? That means that if I choose for every real element of Cantor space, um, an open neighborhood, then there's a finite subcover. Now, what does it mean to choose a neighborhood for a point in Cantor space? That's choosing a finite initial segment, right? Or, or the function F here is the length of this finite initial segment. So suppose that I have a function that for every real, chooses a natural number, which is a length. In fact, chooses a finite initial segment of that real. Then there is a finite subcover, which means I can find finitely many reals, a finite set P, where the, the, those initial segments for those Xs and P cover the entire, entire counter space. Right, so call this an F fine cover for a function from, from reals to natural numbers, which I should, you can think of as, function from reals to initial seg finite initial segments of those reals. So Cousin's lemma for bear class two on the unit interval is equivalent to saying that every bear class two function on Cantor space F has an F fine cover. And in the context of Cantor space, it's uh, the recursion theory uh, gives us, you know, tools to reformulate what it means to be bear class two. Bear class two is the same thing as delta zero three, three definable. Um, in terms of computations, you think about what is a good, uh, what is a bare class two function. It's a function that's computable, except that I first need to take two jumps. Right? So to compute the value, I take two jumps and then there's apply some uniform computable procedure. Okay, so before we do the reversal, I want to uh, give a, um, a somewhat uh, an analysis arg argument that, that, that shows a little bit towards ATR naught, right? So if uh, in a model of ATR naught, we know that the iterated jumps, uh, that's what ATR naught says. Uh, on every well order there's, I can iterate the Turing jump. Um, so let's look at you know, the standard, like uh, computable ordinals, the standard jumps for zero to the alpha. Uh, we say that if we've got a standard model and where we have Cousin's lemma for back class two functions, then zero to the alpha has to be an element of the model. Another way of saying that, I didn't write this on the slide, is that uh, for every alpha computable, there is a bare class two light face gauge um, where every delta fine um, uh, 
subcovers, uh, finite subcover has to contain zero alpha as one of the tags. The, 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 this, the proof essentially that I'm, I'm going to present shows that. All right, so um, let's simplify, let's do alpha equals omega. So why does zero omega have to exist in the model where I have Cousin's lemma for Beck plus two functions? Okay, so what is zero to the omega? A zero omega is the, the uniform join of the zero to the ends. I start with the empty set and then I take the jump and then the jump of that and the jump of that and the jump of that. And then I put them all in one big array and take the join of them, right? So it's a, it's a real where the nth column is, is written zero to the nth. Now, suppose that I have an element of counter space X, which is not zero to the omega, any other real. Well then, so there is some least n where the nth column of X is not the nth column of zero to the omega, i.e. the nth column of X is not zero to the n. Call that n sub X. Also, well, there is some least K where that nth column of X disagrees with zero to the n, call that k sub x. Now, calculating iterated jumps is well complicated, but it takes that many jumps, um, I'm not saying much, but identifying that something is the jump of something else, or that it is the double jump of something else, or that it's a, the omega jump or the nth jump, that's a pi zero to relation. If, if you're given something and saying, I'm the jump of that, you can check that with two jumps. And, and, and this is true for an iteration, right? That basically it needs to say uh, for every E, um, the thing, you know, it, the correct answer about whether this computation with this Oracle holds is written correctly in the correct bit of the next column, right? So X double jump, given X, which is not the zero to omega, X double jump, can find those numbers in x and kx. It can, it can go column by column and say, are you the empty set? Yes, no, x double jump can tell this. Is the next, if, if, if no, then great. And I, k, n is zero and k is the least uh, one on that first column. If the answer is yes, this is the empty set. Well, is the next column empty set jump, zero jump? X double jump can tell. And if no, then we found N and, 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 and we can find the, the least K. And if not, then we move on. This, this is a finite process. It will eventually stop. Right. What that means that X double jump can compute a bit, which guarantees X and zero to the omega disagree on this bit. Right, after taking the pairing function. And so it can compute a sufficiently long initial segment of X where zero to the omega is not in this Clopin set. It disagrees with one of those finitely many bits of X. So this function is a Bertel class two function. It just uses the double jump uniformly to compute it. And there is no F of fine cover because in the real world, zero to the omega exists. And again, this is absolute for the model. So the model has to contain zero to the omega. It has to know that this F is, um, is not a gauge. Okay, so now let's, let's go through the, the, the details of the reversal. This is, this is my last slide. Um, let the M is a model of uh, arithmetic comprehension in which arithmetic transfinite recursion fails. So there's some, some Delta star, which in the sense of M, M thinks it's uh, ordinal. It's a well-founded, uh, well-ordering of the natural numbers in the sense of M. Maybe it is an ordinal, maybe it isn't. We don't know. M thinks it's an ordinal. And in M, there is no jump hierarchy along Delta star. I cannot, um, um, I cannot iterate the Turing jump um, along Delta star within M. Now look at all the, the elements of Delta star in the sense of von Neumann ordinals, look at all the initial segments of Delta star. Some of them may, you know, for each one, maybe there's an iteration of the Turing jump in M, maybe there isn't, right? The whole thing doesn't, but some, you know, short initial segments may. 
right? And, and because I'm arguing from better class two functions, I can already assume that the model satisfies arithmetic comprehension because bare class one implies arithmetic comprehension. Uh, oops. Um, right, so arithmetic comprehension, right? Because checking whether something is an iterated jump is arithmetic, arithmetic comprehension, which implies also you know, arithmetic induction, uh, will tell us that um, if there is an iteration of the Turing jump along some beta, then that's unique. So call that zero to the beta. Everything in the sense of M, right? May or may not exist. But if it exists, it's unique. And now I look at the initial segment of delta star on which there are iterations of, and on which you know, all those betas for which zero to the beta exists. And of course, if zero to the beta exists, then if I shorten beta, then I just cut it off and that's an iteration you know, so, uh, along the initial segment. So, so I is an initial segment of delta star, which is of course uh, not an element of delta star. Oh, not an element of M. Now, ACA naught implies that I does not have a greatest element. Right, because if zero to the beta exists and a, with ACA naught, I can take a single Turing jump. So zero to the beta plus one also exists, All right? So this is something without a last element, it's a cut. So now take any element of the model. And now I'm kind of running something argument similar to the, the zero to the omega argument. There is a least beta in the sense of delta star um, such that the beta column of X is not zero to the beta. There's the least place where it fails to be a Turing um, uh, iteration of the Turing jump along delta star. And along that column, there's at least place where they, X to the, the beta column of X and zero to the beta disagree. And X double jump can find these. So X double jump can compute some sufficiently long initial segment so that it's already disagreed from zero to the beta on that point. But by the way that we set up this machinery of iterated Turing jumps, that means once I've disagreed with zero to the beta, then I've got it wrong. Then it's, it also disagrees with zero to the gamma for all the later gammas that come along in delta star. Once, once I've screwed up at beta, um, I can't get anything right again. Um, right, so not only this, finite that this neighborhood of X doesn't contain zero to the beta. It doesn't compute zero to the gamma for any gamma bigger than beta. So now take a F fine cover, take the maximum of all the, the, the beta X's for all those finitely many points, add one, then I have something because I doesn't have a last element. This beta star is a maximum plus one of all these things that are in I. So it is in I, but in the model, there cannot be zero to the beta star. And that's a contradiction, right? So zero to the beta star cannot ex you know, must exist by the definition of I, but cannot be covered. So it wasn't actually a, a, a fine cover. Um, that's the proof. And uh, I, I kind of like this proof because I mean, uh, maybe somebody in the audience um, can tell me whether they, they've seen this kind of uh, style of argument uh, for reversals for ATI or not, but I'm, I'm not sure that I've seen this kind of, uh, um, kind of argument by contradiction directly with, with uh, iterated uh, Turing jumps, but that, that might be just because I, I didn't, I'm, I'm not as familiar with the literature as I should be. Um, right, so, so thanks for listening. Yes, thank you, Noam. Um, you asked the first question yourself more or less. So if anybody wants to answer that, or if anybody has questions of their own, speak up. Okay, just a second here. Oh, okay, I'm right here. Linda? Was, so uh, first, uh, related to uh, actually the question that you asked, Noam, I was uh, wondering uh, if, uh, if there is also like a, just a direct proof like from uh, that uh, bear, or excuse me, from that uh, Cousin's Lemma consequence to ATR. Uh, and I have a second question also, which is, uh, so you uh, have been uh, saying that the being a delta fine partition uh, is absolute. And I was wondering if you could just say more about what, uh, about why that is. 
Um, oh, so, I mean, you're asking for whether we have a simpler proof of this uh, reversal, and um, no, I mean, we didn't really work that hard to try to find one, but uh, that, that, this is the proof that I know. Um, uh, what do I mean by absolute? Uh, look, all of these proofs are, I'm, I, I've been kind of like sneakily lying a little bit to trying to give you the, 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 the general ideas rather than the actual formal details. Um, so um, let me look somewhere. All right, so uh, let, let's look at this uh, example here, which is similar to the continuous case, right? Um, suppose that there is a, a delta fine partition in M. Right, what does that mean? That means that there's finitely many points in M, which, which determine the, the endpoints of intervals, right? And for each interval, there's a point in that interval and delta of that point is bigger than the length of that interval. Now, all of these facts, right, don't change, like right? all models that contain all of these points and calculate delta the same way, um, agree on this, right? They agree whether this, these are finitely many points, they agree whether this point is in this interval or in that interval, they agree that they calculate delta of x and they can tell whether it's bigger than the length of the interval or smaller than the length of the interval. This is all very finite stuff. It, it, it doesn't depend on what other sets, you know, on the rest of the second order part of the model. It's in some sense arithmetic. And so adding many points, you know, adding Z star to the model is not gonna change whether something is a delta fine partition or not. So if there is one in M, then it's really a delta fine partition. If there is no such thing, then there is no such thing in M. Now the, the, the formal proof doesn't talk about these kinds of like, uh, you know, going between the real world and M, it's, it's all arguments within M, but, but What's really going on is, is uh, you know, behind the scenes is something like this. Linda says she may ask you more about this after the talk, if possible. Um, sure, yeah, happily. Next question is from Stefan Lemp. Hi, Neil, nice talk. Uh, oh, thank quick you. question. Um, in the forward proof from ATR naught, you said that you need more than SQL one induction. Can you say how much more? I'm just oh, curious. Look, I mean, again, I, uh, uh, where are we? Um, uh, here. I think I wrote it down. It was a Boolean combination of sigma one one and pi one one with a bounded quantifier before it. And it seemed to me that I couldn't swallow the bounded quantifier, that I didn't have enough induction to, to swallow the bounded quantifier in this Boolean combination. So this is why sigma one one induction wasn't quite enough. Now we didn't investigate this deeply. We were kind of lazy and we wrote delta one two induction is enough. Um, it's way more than enough. Um, but yeah, I mean, and we didn't have any reversal to any kind of induction. I don't know, uh, again, maybe people who are experts can tell me whether they know any reversal to sigma one one induction in the literature. I, I did a short search and I didn't find anything. I don't know how to prove sigma one one induction from any assumptions like Kuzan's lemma. Okay, we'll go to the next question from Alberto Marconi. I know I'm nice, nice talk. So I have oh, a, well, an attempt to answer your, your question and then a question. So my attempt mm. is, well, I've, I've not seen a proof stated like that, but I suspect that this can be proved, turned into a proof using pseudo hierarchies in the way that uh, Simpson does in his book. I mean, it, uh, it, looks, it looks sort of, you know, like a pseudo hierarchy turned upside down or something like that. That's my, mm. my impression, you know, after listening to your talk. My question is, if you are planning to move a little bit, maybe forward uh, beyond Borel functions and maybe try to get to pi one comprehension for Cousin's lemma. Uh, what functions would those be? I mean, how, how, uh, yeah, that this is, this is my ignorance. I, uh, in, in second order arithmetic, what functions with countable codes 
makes sense like do we know anything about i mean i guess you can write the pi on one definable function but um, other than writing its pi on one definition do we know anything about it do we know how to work with these things uh, i mean uh, basically i i don't know that's maybe maybe the you know why it's it could be interesting to do it i mean it might be yeah, 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 yeah. one two measurable function or something like that I mean, yeah but i mean set up a code for that even, for sure i mean but these functions are not even measurable right so i mean that's uh, yeah i mean uh, we we haven't tried um, the, there might be something very interesting there okay we have a question from junlei cho and junlei go Thanks, Noah. Uh, so I was going to ask about sigma one one induction, but then you answered the question in the response to mm. Alberto. So um, I, I will say that in in a paper with Richard and uh, James Barnes, uh, we we do have a like a graph theory principle which is equivalent to sigma one one choice plus sigma one one induction. Mm. So there is a reversal there, not a difficult one, but um, no, that's but it interesting. Exists. And uh, I mean, I guess there's also the possibility that, well, maybe it doesn't reverse, right? Maybe you can do some sort of uh, like what Neiman did for for those for those uh, linear ordering things, use a steel forcing to get some uh, some kind of non-standard non-standard model. But uh, I don't know. Yeah, thanks. Where uh, where Cousin's lemma will hold, but induction fails, and in some mm. yeah. Again, I. Uh... I don't know enough about this, uh, but that sounds very interesting. Oh, oh, I see one more question all the way across. Sorry. Um, this will be from Arnaud Powley. Thanks. Um, so, if, um, I mean, your arguments always work in, in the way that, oh, I'm, I'm sort of creating a fake question. Um, and since the model can't prove that the question was fake, it's supposed to answer, which it can't because the question was fake. But but of course, they are sort of it's it, it wouldn't be that difficult to sort of turn those fake questions into real questions by saying where the sort of function that you have constructed is zero, give it some other value, and then then just sort of see there is a solution which would include need to include one of those points which the model doesn't know but that seems to turn up the complexity of the function have you thought out what 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 what's going on there um well i mean when you're just um you know, i mean in some sense there's this kind of fakeness is uh uh is embedded in the situation, right? You're you're working with uh, with something like in a model where there's an infinite tree with no path. Well, what do you mean? There is a path. Okay. So 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 what this model thinks about paths and 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 you know emptiness, not emptiness of, of closed sets is 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 not correct. So yeah, we are playing on and we're, we are playing with that, and we have to, right? That, that's what it means for weak and examiner to fail. Um, you can write these proofs right in in a way like you know here's a model um here's a closed set um as you say um here's a gauge if it, you know, the model this close is empty therefore this is a gauge so so you can rephrase it in a way that looks like less like you're 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 cheating but um but i'm not sure that it really changes the essence of the proof and yeah i mean you can you can change with the value from zero to something positive but then uh um but then um your um you know the, the function is not continuous anymore um with where where your strategy um completely makes sense is in this uh, slide where i said turn this proof into a proof that there is a you know forget models there is a better class to gauge um where every delta fine partition has to contain zero alpha it's basically take this gauge I didn't tell you how to define it on zero to the omega. On zero to the omega, define it to be anything positive, and you're and you're good, right? And 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 this stays within the class of 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 uh, their class too. Okay. Okay. Any more questions? 
Anything coming on? Let me think about that. Yeah. Okay. Well, seeing nothing further, I suggest that we thank Noam again. No, thank, thanks, Russell, and, and thanks for listening.